Welcome everyone to this webinar brought to you by RCBS Knowledge. This is part of a series of, of webinars on infection control and this is number three in the series on infection prevention and control policies and procedures in routine practice. This should be a really practical webinar which I'm really looking forward to and we've got Liz Branscombe um, to talk to us on this subject. RCBS Knowledge is there to advance the quality of veterinary care for the benefit of animals, society, the public. The way that RCBS Knowledge meets this mission is by championing the use of evidence-based approach, inspiring a culture of continuous quality improvement in practice, and having some great resources available, both on um, evidence-based medicine and some fantastic quality improvement resources there on our website, um, available to the profession and the wider public. We are a separate organisation to the RCVS. So as I said, this is part of a series of webinars. Number one, it was about COVID. And I think that we had lots of people watch that. And I hope if you haven't seen it, you will um, watch it. And obviously COVID is very important in infection control and it's not going to go away for quite a long time. So that's still very relevant. And infection control is an ongoing issue for all of us in practice. In part two, Tim Nuttall um, from Edinburgh, who was, Tim Nuttall did the first um, COVID webinar along with Alan Radford from Liverpool. In part two, Tim Nuttall talks about organisms of concern and modes of transmission, which gives us the evidence base for um, how we need to clean things. And now we're going to move on to part three, which is going to talk about the practicalities of actually doing this and implementing it in your practice. So as I said before, we're very lucky to have Liz Branscombe. Liz qualified as a veterinary nurse in 1986. She worked in small animal and mixed practice and then referral practice, and then was at the RVC as senior surgery nurse between 93 and 97. Liz has been employed at Davis Veterinary Specialist since it started in 1998, undertaking a variety of clinical nursing roles and is currently the training manager with responsibility for development of induction training programmes for new employees and in-house and external training for team members. Liz was a member of RCBSVN Council and the chairman uh, during the time when significant milestones for the nursing profession were achieved, culminating in statutory regulation. So we're very um, lucky to have Liz. So over to you now, Liz. Thank you, Pam. We're going to start with um, a quick overview of what the session will uh, cover today. Um, we'll start by looking at creating an infection control group within um, practice and then move on to um, what you might consider if developing biosecurity policy. And biosecurity measures are those that minimise the risk um, of infection transmission. So there will be information uh, within that policy that helps people understand the concept of, of biosecurity. Then we will talk about the role of the infection prevention and control nurse. We say nurse, but this could also be uh, any other nominated lead person within the practice. And then we will look at considerations for infection control in the practice um, and in different areas of practice. Um, it's a massive topic, but um, I hope to flag up a few sort of key um, considerations that you might think about when you're um, creating your infection prevention and control policies. So considerations for creating an infection control group within your practice. So um, representatives from all of the practice teams should be uh, involved within the group. Um, and depending on the size, obviously, uh, of the practice, there may, there may be quite a few num uh, members within the group. But it is important to have information and representation from all departments. And initially, it would be sensible to ask volunteers. Um, it, it, is much easier if you have people who are willing and interested um, and are therefore able to help motivate other members of, of the team. You need to think about the goals 
that the group might want um, and these may vary depending on the type of practice um, and as you said before the size of the practice um, but as a starting point there are some ideas here for um, goals that you could use and the goals need to be realistic um, and work for you within your within your um, own practice so initially think about um, protecting staff and clients from zoonotic disease you would aim to create an optimum environment for patient care where risk of nosocomial infection is minimized demonstrate appropriate infection control and disease disease surveillance practices so you might need to think about what they might be and what would work for you within your uh, environment and then um, the other uh, goal of the group would be to provide advice to staff and clients regarding the control and prevention of infectious disease and that would include routine protocols but also being um, available to advise in circumstances where there might be disease outbreak or changes such as we've had recently with the um, COVID-19 uh, uh, um, pandemic. Next. The remit um, of your infection control group, um, again, you might think this, this is obvious, but you, you would have to adapt this to suit um, yourselves. Um, when developing policies and procedures um, for biosecurity, you need to think about what, what is best practice um, and uh, gold standard. However, they need to be cost efficient um, and achievable too. You don't want to set um, unreasonable standards or um, actions within, within the procedures and um, protocols that you develop. And then once you you've have the um, protocols in place, they need to be managed. Uh, at the implementation of the protocols needs to be managed um, and uh, ensure that there is compliance and, and adherence to best practice um, where you can. And another thing to consider is um, the group uh, should offer advice or be consulted if there are changes to workflow within the practice due to practice expansion um, or, or um, changes of routine um, because um, that could save time and, and money uh, in the future. The group will need to report on activities, infection, on, uh, infection control and share information with the rest of the practice and that might be done in newsletters or, or regular um, training or uh, updates uh, with uh, team meetings and um, you also need to consider um, developing staff expertise um, and educating um, accord, according to the um, team ro members role um, to give them uh, an insight to um, the biosecurity, uh, the concept of biosecurity and also some information about um, routes of, of disease transmission uh, etc. If you have um, members of, of the team, they might not be members of your um, contr infection control group, but if there are people who um, can also be highlighted as champions for infection control, this is a very useful way of motivating and encouraging everybody to take responsibility. The policy will include, as we've said, measures specific to the practice that will minimise the risk of transmission of infectious disease and reduce the incidence of hospital associated infections. And the previous uh, webinar um, that discusses routes of transmission will give more information about this, this subject, but you have to consider animal to animal, human to human and animal to human um, uh, methods of trans transmission and limit those um, diseases. So 
what to include in the policy. Um, and again, um, the group, the infection control group will need to discuss what um, they feel would be best to include in, in the um, policy. But it's worth perhaps listing in the policy what the goals of, and the remit of the infection control group are, so that that is shared with practice members as well. And then maybe spending some time um, giving information about the principles of infection control and how these would then guide the development of your policies. So there are key principles uh, of infection control are listed here. And um, obviously one of the main um, principles is to optimize hygiene and using standard precautions such as hand hygiene, which we'll discuss a, a little bit further on in the, in the presentation, um, use of PPE at the right level, and then also um, cleaning and disinfection uh, protocols and procedures. And secondly, um, the, a, a principle of infection um, control is how we break transmission um, and therefore we have to understand the roots of transmission. And these could be uh, such as aerosol, oral indirect or direct contact. And then obviously a large area is the um, fomite uh, transmission route. And then we need to think about targeting and refining infection control procedure through surveillance. And so you would need to include in your policy how you might go about doing that within your practice. And uh, lastly, enhance education and awareness. So we need to um, make sure that every member in the team um, from induction level going through to sort of annual reviews have um, uh, continual information about um, the risks uh, associated with um, infection and um, communicate the purpose of, of our protocols. We next consider the role of the infection prevention uh, and control nurse. We say nurse, but this could be a, a, any other lead person, but preferably somebody who has a, a good understanding um, of um, infection control and the concepts that we want to um, share with other practice members. And the role should be embedded in the organizational structure. Um, the person who takes on this role should be supported at a, a management level and they should feel empowered to carry out the role. And um, that will then uh, encourage others to um, go forward and uh, take on the, the um, ideas um, that the infection control group wish to share. So the, this person would formalize an approach to infection control, looking at um, evidence-based protocols. They, part of the role would involve um, uh, perhaps surveying perceptions within the practice to uh, infection control. And as we said, reviewing um, procedures and uh, updating as necessary. And part of that will also include surveillance and audit. And there are lots of uh, things that fall into this category that might need to be considered. Um, and, and actually the role uh, is, is well, you, can, you can make it as, as big as you wish really, but um, there are a lot of key things that need to be considered. Surveillance um, such like, um, uh, environmental um, uh, uh, monitoring and um, perhaps bacterial uh, 
culture um, and looking at antibiotic surveillance and then also adherence to protocols such as, as hand hy hygiene and developing audits um, for different um, uh, processes within the practice. And then also uh, a key part of the role uh, would be education and training. And so uh, this person would be involved in developing material for new starters at the practice and also members at different levels and different um, within different roles. So that we're the clinical versus the non-clinical roles. And um, they might develop specific training sessions such as, uh, for hand hygiene um, or discussions around antibiotic um, uh, resistance, uh, awareness and, and so on. And then, um, as we have said before, they might, might need to adapt and revise protocols in light of something happening um, on a day-to-day -day basis within the practice and it might be something uh, like a global pandemic or it might be something that actually is, is um, more local so it could be something for example like um, a cat starts sneezing uh, within um, a cat ward or, or, or dogs start coughing in a ward and, and how are you going to manage those um, situations uh, with regard to um, uh, protecting other patients. So I think, um, as we said, optimizing hygiene is, is a key principle of uh, infection control. And hand hygiene is acknowledged to be the single most important factor in minimizing the transmission of contagious organisms. And you could, I could probably spend a whole hour talking about um, hand hygiene and, and it, uh, protocols associated with that. I'm going to, to flag a few um, key points that you might uh, include if you're de developing your own hand hygiene protocol. There's a lot of information um, and uh, up-to-date um, evidence. Uh, if you have a look at the World Health Organization website, there are resources there as well that you can use within your practice. Every team member should be aware of when hands should be cleaned. And, and our next slide will talk about the five moments of, of hand hygiene. And um, they should adhere to a standard protocol protocol should be displayed and available um, for everybody and um, it, it should be commonplace. One of the, the key elements um, and um, I think it, it adopted in quite a lot of veterinary practices now um, would be the bare arms below the elbow policy and um, the reason for doing this is that it allows um, easier um, decontamination of forearms and uh, whilst hand washing and also removes the risk of um, uh, transmission of infection from clothing when you're holding or restraining patients. So anyone in a clinical setting should be adopting this policy uh, in my opinion. We would also consider notes in the policy about keeping nails short, um, not having uh, using nail varnish and uh, false nails, um, which I think is probably um, you know something that that veterinary professionals are, are aware of already. And um, another thing to um, include would be covering any. Um, cuts or abrasions to the skin uh, to keep to keep those covered and moist keep hands well moisturized as well look after your hands um, and then at this point we will just mention um, hand rub procedure versus or hand wash um, procedure which um, would be the the method of choice well the world's health organization advise that generally speaking hand rub uh, with an alcohol-based preparation 
would be the um, first choice. Uh, it removes organisms, majority of organisms effectively, and requires less time, approximately 20 to 30 seconds, um, to carry out. And uh, it, in a, a lot of cases, is less irritant to the skin. However, um, they advise that it is not a replacement for hand wash uh, with soap and water. And this process should be um, used if hands are visibly dirty or soiled, so with blood or other organic matter, um, or perhaps if there's potential, has been potential exposure to spore forming pathogens. Um, and the hand wash procedure takes uh, a bit longer, um, which is 40 to 60 seconds. So these are the uh, five key moments um, of hand hygiene as, as suggested by uh, the World Health Organization. Before touching a patient, before a clean or aseptic procedure, after body fluid exposure risk, after touching a patient, and after touching patient surroundings. And obviously you may want to adapt or add in other um, points to this, but this is the, the main concept of um, the five key moments. And um, as the um, illustration shows, um, rub, they're suggesting that you rub hands uh, for hand hygiene and wash hands when visibly soiled. So um, that's a message to take away. So um, another uh, pr principle or key point is environmental cleaning and disinfection. And obviously we have um, uh, subsequent webinars in this series and, and one of them is um, uh, specifically uh, going to discuss disinfection, uh, use of disinfectants and um, uh, when and where to use them. So I'm not going to go into too much detail at this point about that, but just some, some points that you might want to consider. So you need to assess all areas of the practice, both clinical and non-clinical, and look at them according to risk of infection, and then make um, uh, an assessment of the level of cleaning that is required. And from that, you can then develop your cleaning schedules and um, look at um, a standard um, approach. If possible, uh, one disinfectant, um, one dilution would be ideal because um, it helps people to follow protocols. Now, obviously, you understand that this is not always practical, especially um, in practices where there are various different types of work being undertaken. But uh, as far as possible, um, simplify the process uh, with easy to follow protocols. And um, as with all things, appropriate training is necessary. And um, it's an area where uh, sometimes um, it, people um, assume that everybody knows how to um, do something. And um, we would um, need to make sure that um, part of our induction protocols cover um, the cleaning and the um, reasons behind why we do what we do. The protocols need to be readily available and displayed if possible in uh, an obvious place and um, not, not hidden away so that we can refer to them as often as necessary. And then another um, big area would be to make sure that you have um, your cleaning schedules um, sorted out and then establish checklists to make sure that um, the 
routine intervals um, and frequency uh, of cleaning is being carried out. And then uh, monitoring the environment uh, following cleaning, there's a few ways that this can uh, be done. Um, some people will be collecting uh, swabs uh, for culture from the environment uh, to see um, what uh, is, is cultured and um, others will be um, using fluorescent markers which can be um, uh, put in, in certain areas and then checked afterwards with UV light to establish um, how clean they are. Um, and then also um, some practices are starting to look at surface hygiene monitoring um, with ATP monitors. It's, just, it's a, um, a process that has been undertaken in the uh, food hygiene industry. Uh, in, and um, it, at this stage, um, it's being trialled in, in veterinary practice, I believe. It could be a, a useful tool, but it's still in the process of um, uh, trialling that. And um, the idea behind that would be that the um, surfaces are cleaned and then um, swabs are taken and um, uh, examined by the monitor to detect any residue of organic material. Next, wanted to talk about um, uh, categorizing patients. Um, this process um, helps to um, establish uh, where um, patients um, might be kenneled and also how we might manage those um, patients by looking at um, their clinical condition and the risk um, of infection. And um, a simple tier system can be adopted and once that um, has been um, created, the tier system would be um, shared and displayed so that everybody within the clinical teams understands the um, concept of, of which patients fall into which category. So as a suggestion, um, you would obviously you need to create a chart or a, a document that included the different tier levels and uh, in the practice where I work we we have a, a system of tiers between one and well four uh, and then we have a, another category which is, is referred to as four plus um, and then uh, you need to think about defining the patient type that fall within each of the tiers and look at some examples of cases to give people an, an idea um, of the conditions that would fall into each category. And then once uh, they have done that, where in the practice the patient's going to be housed and what level uh, of PPE would be required um, to manage those cases. And um, just as an example, tier one be your patients um, that would be at high risk for acquiring infection due to poor immune status, for example. So they would be your, perhaps your unvaccinated patients, neonates uh, or immunocompromised patients. And they would be housed in, in a regular ward environment, but they would be barrier nursed in those situations to prevent them from um, getting infected. Tier two might be patients with no evidence of, of contagious disease. So these would be elective procedures perhaps, and they would be in, in a regular ward environment with no PPE. Tier three would be your patients that have infectious disease that can be contained with barrier nursing alone. So something like your patient with ringworm or um, salmonella or, or something like that. They would be in the regular ward area, um, but they would be um, 
barrier nursed in, in that situation. Uh, and then we move on to the higher tiers where, where these are patients that would be housed in, in isolation and they would be um, patients who have known or suspected to have highly contagious disease. So things like your, your parvovirus or distemper um, or kennel cough. Uh, and they would definitely be um, managed uh, by barrier nursing and appropriate PPE. So now I'm just going to um, move on to the different areas of the practice and just highlight some considerations for infection control to, uh, I think for some uh, of you, will, you will already have protocols that include these points, but um, there might be some additional things that you wish to uh, consider when revising or developing protocols. So in general, um, ward areas, uh, if you have the space, um, you should have uh, separate wards for different disciplines or surgical versus non-surgical cases or medicine or surgery cases and separate them, them out. And then obviously a separate isolation facility as well. Understand that in, in some practices that, that isn't possible. We'll talk about isolation facilities, a separate slide in a moment. Um, if you can separate your food preparation uh, area so that you're using uh, a different area uh, for food preparation as opposed to where you might be um, uh, washing up uh, catalyst trays or cleaning and bathing patients and that sort of thing. So keep, keep your food prep area separate. Have PPE, uh, gloves, aprons or um, uh, long-sleeved um, thumb loop gowns uh, available and ready uh, so that people can, can use them. They'd be more inclined to use them if they are there and available. And consider appropriate waste management and making sure that bins are, are highlighted and uh, waste segregation is, is obvious. And foot operated bins uh, uh, will obviously mean that um, you limit the number of times that the lids of the bins are, are touched. If we're thinking about uh, sinks and hand washing, so the ideal scenario would be to have a sink that is identified as a hand wash sink only and make sure that um, there, are, there is uh, the appropriate um, lever operated mixer taps if possible and that the dispensers for soap um, are elbow operated or ideally automatic soap dispensers. And um, if you're considering uh, soap dispensers as a new purchase, then look at the uh, varieties that are now available with sealed cartridge systems, which have an integral pump, which mean that you don't have to open and pour in a refill of soap. Um, soap dispensers can be a reservoir for bacterial contamination. And if you're constantly topping up uh, a soap dispenser with liquid soap um, and using um, uh, putting new soap onto old, then um, you, you're just ending up with a, a, a reservoir of, of um, contamination potentially. Um, it's useful to have hand wash uh, and or hand rub posters uh, around or near the sinks and if you are putting up posters make sure that they are laminated so that you can wipe them clean easily uh, and they're not getting um, scruffy and um, dirty. Uh, notoriously areas around sinks get splashed and, um, and contaminated and if you have paper um, posters there then they're going to be um, dirty and scruffy pretty quickly. Also consider paper towel dispensers and, and have those by the sink so that um, you're using um, 
the paper towel to dry your hands and then disposing of it. And um, it's important to think about uh, with regard to infection co control when you're um, writing protocols for management of um, cases and uh, patient care um, procedures because you need to think about um, the aspects of infection control and make that part of the routine. So um, always advising um, the use of, of gloves uh, when you're managing lines, so IVs, feeding tubes, chest strains, or any anything that's um, uh, a, a line in or out um, of the patient needs to be managed appropriately. And you, you need to have um, a set um, protocol for for um, managing those, and it's it's really useful to to have those almost like um, a checklist for for case management. And then, um, obviously, as we we've said a number of times already, cleaning schedules um, and checklists need to be um, uh, considered for each area. And uh, the next slide will talk a bit about. Um, different considerations for cleaning in within the ward area. And um, at this point, I just wanted to mention dog leads. Um, Colour-coded dog leads are useful, and I expect a lot of people already use this system. Um, a, a red lead we would use for patients that need to be barrier nursed. And so we would take a lead, red lead. Um, we wouldn't um, admit patients with their own leads. Um, but we would label a red lead and that would stay with, with that patient um, to be barrier nursed. And, and patients in wards that need to be barrier nursed would have a different colour hospitalisation sheet. So they would, they would have a pink hospitalisation sheet. So it would be an obvious sign as you approach that, that patient that you need to be barrier nursing. And the other thing to say with, with uh, leads in, in the ward area is if you can uh, have two sets of leads, so different colours, maybe um, a green set and a black set, um, and then in alternate weeks you might um, wash those so that um, you, you're not continually reusing leads that um, are swapping leads between inpatients for an extended length of time. So as I said, the next slide, we'll go on to talk a bit more about cleaning within in the ward area. So um, we, we've looked at um, the, the ward and hopefully there are, if there are different zones or uh, wards within that area, um, you might be able to um, rest wards, you might be able to clean in, in different zones of the practice. And so therefore, um, you would have a specific set of cleaning equipment for each zone. So you wouldn't be sharing cleaning equipment between wards and theatre, for example. In the ward area, consider uh, the fomites that you um, uh, will encounter, um, high touch sites within the environment. I'm not going to list them all, there, there are many. Um, keep your surface, work surfaces as um, uncluttered as possible uh, and it makes, makes for easier and a tidier working environment, easier to clean. Um, the cleaning equipment, uh, as we've suggested, colour-coded, needs to be fit for purpose. Keep it clean and replace it regularly. And um, and, and uh, for example, use um, uh, uh, a double mopping system for uh, um, cleaning floors. Um, you might have um, different color mop heads for different areas. Um, I'm sure you, you know what double mopping is or, or double bucket mopping and um, you would have um, two or in some cases three different reservoirs so you'd have your cleaning um, solution in, in uh, one 
area and then you'd have a separate um, section of the mop bucket for rinsing your mop. Um, you might have different mops again, flat surface mop, sponge mop for doing walls and, and things like that. And then also thinking about steam cleaning too. Industrial washing machines are, are useful if you can um, accommodate them because you can have um, some that incorporate uh, an ozone disinfection, a disinfectant system, and they would automatically be disinfecting as they're washing the, in, within the cycle. Um, otherwise, you need to use a, a hot wash for pet bedding and um, could put disinfectant in the washing um, load. And then obviously, hopefully goes without saying, don't wash your, your bedding uh, with, along with um, your theatre um, wear. And then a, another idea that might you might uh, suggest in practice would be that staff would um, arrive at work and then change into work wear and then change again before leaving so that um, they're leaving their work clothes at, at work. So we just um, briefly talk about the isolated patient, um, talk, talk about um, the isolation ward, and then we'll, we'll go on to talk about how um, we might manage uh, an isolated case having procedures within the practice. So uh, at, um, uh, ideally, a hospitalised, uh, this patient's patients would be hospitalised in a designated ward for isolated cases, and that ward would have, um, excuse me, an area where you could have stored uh, equipment and consumable items that would be um, easily accessible, but not within the um, ward itself. If you haven't got that facility, within your practice, if you have patients that need to be isolated, you would need to maybe mark a zone around that cage or kennel um, with hazard tape, just as a, a to demarcate the area and um, make it a, a visual reminder to people that they shouldn't be um, stepping over that line unless they are um, uh, in the right um, clothing or that they are actually carrying out a task that's necessary. Uh, it's useful to have uh, written protocols for how you manage the isolation area and the patients within that area. So we've spoken about categorizing patients, but um, you, you need to have a common um, protocol that um, keeps uh, um, considers rather the um, way the cases are managed and there will be I believe some examples of protocols um, uh, available on, on the RCBS knowledge website uh, as a resource um, as examples and keep equipment uh, separate color coded uh, and um, so that it's clear that those things are um, from isolation and, and need to um, not be used in the general ward. And you would be, um, depending on, on the type of case, um, changing clothing. And so you would need to consider um, a, an area where staff could change um, that's near to your isolation facility if possible, so that after they've worked in that area, in, the contaminated clothing um, can be um, just kept um, in one place and not um, causing risk of, of transmitting infection elsewhere. A separate exercise area um, is ideal and enclosed so that um, uh, near to the isolation, so you're not walking um, too far with these patients. And then consider keeping patient notes outside isolation, but you do obviously need to identify the patient and you would um, potentially have some laminated cards where you could um, fill in the patient's name and case number and then that could be wiped clean um, or, or 
um, renewed um, at each um, for each case. So moving uh, patients and uh, sorry, isolated patients that need to undergo procedures because you need to be moved um, around the practice. And um, again, we'll, we'll um, make this example available, but the idea would be that you would need to plan in advance where will the procedure take place, what's um, the sort of a minimal disruption that, to the rest of the practice um, that you can uh, you can uh, uh, avoid, uh, sorry, contamination to other um, patients and other um, areas of the practice. So prepare in advance everything that you're going to need, but um, keep keep the majority of things to one side so they don't get contaminated. Um, and so if they're not needed, they can be returned to, to um, their location. Keep people to a minimum. And everybody that's involved in that procedure would need to wear PPE. When you move a patient, if you can, if there are enough um, people to do so, it's useful to assign um, what we would refer to as a clean runner. So this person wouldn't be handling the patient, but they would um, be helping um, to uh, go and collect things or open doors or uh, so that um, you're not um, creating um, uh, an infection risk or you're keeping that risk to a minimum. If you don't have that clean person, um, you're going to need to consider removing PPE, taking off gloves and gowns, leaving the area, collecting what you need and then coming back, putting the PPE back on. So. Um, it, if possible, a clean uh, runner is beneficial in this procedure. And if you are moving the patients uh, around, uh, if possible, um, put them on a trolley to minimise um, the, the contact with, with the, um, the walkways. But if the patient is walked um, to and from a procedure, you'll need to think about disinfection um, of the the floor. The procedure, uh, as we said, um, uh, the clean runner will not handle the patient, but but will be responsible for handling the clean equipment, opening packets, and, and so on. Uh, and as we've said already, the, the, if you haven't got that facility, then you're going to need to think about um, removing and replacing PPE. Keep the area that you're working in as tidy as possible and discard any waste appropriately. And then the, the um, next uh, few points really all relate to the same sort of thing. You need to identify um, anything that is contaminated and um, mark it as such. So if you are having to leave the area when you turn the patient to the wards, it's obvious to everybody else that that room uh, or that workspace is dirty and it needs to be cleaned before it's reused. So it just uh, avoids the risk of, of inadvertent, inadvertently uh, contaminating things. And cleaning um, as soon as possible, um, the workspace should be cleaned and um, at a level specified by your protocols. And the person cleaning the room should also wear the same level of PPE as what was worn for the procedure. And we're going to just um, talk again, um, it's a topic that um, is huge, but, uh, and could have a webinar in itself, but um, just some key points to uh, consider with your um, patient skin preparation uh, procedure. So it's generally a three-stage process and the first stage would be clipping and um, you should consider wearing gloves when you're clipping, so non-sterile gloves. Um, 
when you pick up the clippers, you need to make sure that they're clean. And you would be doing a, a visual check, checking the uh, clipper, um, clippers um, head is clean, and also that there are no damaged teeth uh, on the blade uh, for the clippers. You might have the regular size 40 clipper blade, um, but then you, you'd start with that. You might also need um, to have a smaller or finer clipper um, head if you were clipping um, uh, delicate skin or um, small areas. So you would need to be uh, considering the technique that you use when you're clipping um, fur. The um, most important thing that you need to avoid at all costs really is clipper rash. Um, and sometimes uh, dogs do have very sensitive skin and it seems that you, you just pick up the clippers and they, they develop a, an, an inflamed and sensitive looking area of skin. But it is, it is important to try not to scrape the clipper head um, along the skin or nick the skin because these are things that are going to cause um, the, the patient to um, want to lick or um, worry at the skin afterwards and it will uh, increase the risk of um, uh, surgical site in infections. And um, the next thing you would be considering would be um, the vacuum that you use to um, remove uh, the clipped fur and um, you need to make sure that you don't touch the nozzle of the of the vacuum against the skin you don't want to be sucking at the, at the skin and you also want to make sure that that's designated for that purpose and it's not a vacuum that is also used for cleaning the floor um, and and the the nozzle um, of the vacuum should be cleaned regularly um, the, um, at this stage, you would also be, if you were um, preparing uh, limbs for surgery, you would need to um, uh, bandage the distal part of, of the limb with cohesive bandage. Uh, and some people would put, be putting a, um, a waterproof or a non-sterile glove under that bandage as well to um, ensure that there is no strike through um, and uh, that the um, foot remained, um, the, the area remained dry. Uh, one, one other thing just to mention about clipping um, also is that um, it, you shouldn't clip in advance, um, too far in advance, it should be done after induction. Um, and uh, although some people want to save time, um, there is an increased risk of um, uh, in infection if the patient is clipped too far in advance. So the second stage of the process is the initial skin uh, preparation. So again, wearing non-sterile gloves, um, the um, most commonly uh, regarded um, uh, scrub solution is chlorhexidine uh, gluconate and at 4%. This, um, uh, some people advocate this uh, is diluted, but actually it's, it's recommended that it's used um, neat on wet swabs. So you would be using lint-free gauze swabs and you would be um, preparing those um, just in advance of the procedure. And so you would um, wet the swabs and squeeze out excess water and then apply the chlorhexidine. And then you would um, have them in a container. And uh, if there was a, a short time between preparation and use, you could use a lidded container. It's also important if you consider when you're taking the non-sterile swabs out of the packet to um, prepare your skin uh, prep solution, you, you need to make sure that you're putting 
clean hands into the packet to get the swabs out. Uh, so it's why we would recommend using, using gloves. Once you start your, your scrub of, of the skin, be, be careful you don't over scrub, you don't want to create um, an inflamed area, but you do need to use a methodical back and forth motion. And it's thought now that this is better than um, the concentric circles that um, some people have been using. But you must make sure that you don't um, return contaminated swabs back to the um, surgical uh, site. And you have uh, enough time to allow um, the contact time for the chlorhexidine to be effective. When you move your patient at this stage to the theatre area or the, the place where you're going to be um, working, you need to make sure that the uh, clipped and prepped site is protected and, and so it's not contaminated en route to, to theatre. The, the final skin prep uh, is a sterile skin prep. So if once you've moved your patient and it's in position for surgery, um, it may be necessary with gloved hands to repeat the chlorhexidine scrub uh, as we've just discussed. But the, the final um, part of the process needs to be sterile and it, it can be carried out in um, a number of different ways. So be using a, a, a solution of chlorhexidine and isopropyl alcohol as recommended and you are, would either have a liquid in a bottle that you pour aseptically into a sterile bowl and then you could use the Rampley sponge holding forceps as in the picture there and um, they would be, uh, we have them in the kit and so the scrubbed uh, assistant would be doing this part of the process um, before draping and so um, the solution is poured aseptically into a bowl and then the forceps are used to paint the solution onto the skin. There are also um, commercially uh, or commercial applicators, um, sterile um, applicators you can use to um, apply the solution. So it, whatever um, process works, but it needs to be sterile. There's a few other considerations. Um, Theatre practice. Um, it, it's commonly thought um, that uh, it's a good idea to um, change into non-sterile theatre wear when working in a theatre and it encourages um, good discipline and, and behaviour and, and people will be aware of infection control and uh, uh, you know to be wearing uh, clean um, clothes is, is, is definitely good but there is limited evidence that it will actively contribute to a reduction in surgical site infection. However, it, 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 as I've said, it, it encourages good behaviour. So I would suggest that that would be the, the way to work within that area. Footwear, again, should be um, uh, non-slip, enclosed and suitable for, for washing and, and disinfection. Cleaning routines need to be developed. Um, so you've got um, a process that everybody follows um, at the start of the day uh, uh, when you're setting up the theatre, um, which incorporates some damp dusting. And then um, you have a set procedure for um, how you um, manage the theatre in between procedures. And then at the end of the day, you'll also be considering deep cleans and intervals for doing that. And um, depending on the um, 
throughput of cases in theatre, um, you'll need to set intervals um, according to your individual practice needs. Also consider uh, writing a, a setting up a protocol for how you would manage uh, potentially infected cases or cases that um, we know are infected and they might have to come to theatre, it might be a septic abdomen or it might be um, uh, a, a case that um, has uh, a known uh, infection, uh, a wound or, or something like that, as well as, you know, using um, your theatre list appropriately and, and having the case run towards the end of the list, um, you need to also consider how you would decontaminate the theatre and the approach to, to that. And then also consider um, within your surgical safety checklists that you have stages for checking things like um, your, your um, sterility of, of surgical equipment and aseptic uh, surgical technique. And then um, we need to limit um, non-essential traffic in the theatre area, keeping footfall um, so you don't want people walking in and out of theatre unnecessarily. And if you have an, an area of the practice that is designated as a theatre area, you might consider um, having um, the, the tacky mats um, at the entrance. So um, if people come to that part point to change shoes or move in and out of theatre with trolleys, there's a sticky surface which picks up any loose um, dirt and debris, fur and and so on that that might be carried in on, on trolley wheels or or um, people's feet at that point uh, and then um, you can peel off uh, the top layer and you've got another sticky surface so they're, they're quite useful some considerations in in the sterile services area so this um, uh, part of the practice needs to be set aside as um, a separate place from where you um, decontaminate or clean uh, your instruments. So you, you don't want to be packing instruments and cleaning, uh, sorry, and sterilizing uh, kits in an area where you're decontaminating, flushing, or creating aerosols from dirty. Um, instruments and so consider that work area and um, you again need to have protocols um, in place for managing instruments and equipment that have come from uh, infected cases or, or um, uh, used in, in procedures where there, there could be some uh, infected material. And then a standard approach to how you um, do these things and particularly packing and deliver training and ensure that everybody is following the, the common um, protocols. Consider areas where instruments are, are stored, instruments are dried. Um, you, want, you don't want uh, any um, strike through from damp packaging, if you're using the peel and seal packages, if you're using um, stainless steel tins, um, then that's slightly uh, easier because um, you haven't got the, the same risk and strike through, but you need to have appropriate storage areas and check and make sure that um, the integrity of the packaging is, is good and not getting damaged by being squashed or, or stored. Um, uh, in in a sort of confined space. Diagnostic rooms and other areas of, of the practice where there is a very high um, traffic area and you've got many um, uh, fomite hazards in, in, in this, uh, these areas and you're looking, you need to be looking at ways to um, ha, uh, ways to provide um, 
easily cleaned surfaces and look at ways to um, uh, declutter and keep these areas tidy. So you can use um, disposable covers if you use the, the foam mattresses on your tables. Um, so on a, an x-ray table, for example, or trolleys, and they, they're just uh, like sleeves that you can uh, take away at the end of the day, um, or you can replace in between cases if, if necessary. And um, we would use uh, stickers that um, just identify at the end of the day if something has been cleaned, and you can get these Clinel um, clean stickers and uh, tape as well that they produce that you can use to identify areas if you've had to decontaminate an area. And um, for foam wedges and uh, positioning aids, um, you can cover those with cling film and that provides a surface that can be wiped down in between cases. But also um, you can put these things in, in, in the wash and launder them. And you need to consider, I know I keep saying, you need to con you have cleaning schedules and checklists and you need to have protocols for setting up and shutting down, but it really is important. And it helps to um, ensure that things don't get missed and um, that we are doing uh, a thorough job. Um, and that's, what, that's one of the key um, points to infection prevention and, and control, doing things properly and not, not cutting corners. Waiting room um, and patient, um, sorry, client um, waiting areas. Um, a few things to consider here. It's useful to have some hand sanitizer available for clients to use, especially at, at the moment, um, but have that obvious. If you have hand washing facilities too, then um, that, that's uh, useful. But as, as also uh, in other areas, we have to think about uh, cleaning routines. Surfaces need to facilitate easy cleaning, we need to have um, uh, processes and not forget these areas when we're developing the, the cleaning routines. And we need to think um, about specific training for non-clinical team members, especially in the area of hand hygiene. Um, it's uh, uh, useful um, for everybody to understand the concept behind hand hygiene. And I think um, recently that's an area that um, every member of the public has probably um, developed a, a better understanding. But certainly if you're in the waiting area and you have unvaccinated um, puppies or kittens, um, people need to be aware the reasons why hand hygiene is, is important. There are an awful lot of areas uh, in the waiting room and reception, um, which uh, are, are fomites and client and patient touch areas. And these would be things like pens, clipboards, um, door handles, and um, we, we would um, also include um, the doors, uh, the uh, areas where dog, dogs' uh, noses go when they come in and out of the practice, and the areas just immediately outside the practice where um, most dogs stop to go as they um, arrive at the practice. So you need to be um, routinely disinfecting these areas as well. And uh, another thing that I wanted just to mention is water bowls. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, clients will ask for water for their pets and um, that's fine, um, but we wouldn't leave a water bowl in the waiting room for communal use and uh, we would have a number of sterile, uh, you know, sterilised clean water bowls under the, the counter at reception and then these are um, used uh, by one patient and then taken away. So. Um, it's, it's not a reservoir for um, everybody's uh, dog to drink from. 
and then just to consider um, dog leads, have a supply of dog leads in, in reception that allows patients to be admitted without um, their own collars and leads and uh, we don't want to be taking in any patient possessions uh, if we can um, because that would add to the risk of uh, infection. And then the, the other non-clinical areas, staff rooms, offices, um, and um, again, we need to think about these areas with regard to our cleaning protocols. And you would have um, different color-coded cleaning equipment for use in staff areas, kitchen areas, and, and so on. And then again, we've got fomites here, clipboards, uh, clipboards uh, key boards are um, one of the biggest areas, especially if you have office areas where you've got um, shared desk space um, or reception areas where you've got um, sh uh, shared telephones and, and so on. And the medical keyboards, which you can get now relatively cheaply, are a useful option that you can be cleaned um, and wiped uh, down uh, effectively. Um, when you you are cleaning the other fomites in, in these areas. So in conclusion, um, it's a mass uh, infection prevention and control is a massive topic, um, but it's a team effort across the whole practice. And so everybody needs to get involved and take responsibility. An infection control group is essential in order to form a consolidated approach. And an infection prevention and control nurse or other lead person will ensure evidence-based policies and protocols are appropriate. And they will regularly review um, these protocols and therefore they will then remain effective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. That, that was amazing. Um, it was so comprehensive. Lots of things I, I hadn't thought of. I totally agree with you about the idea that an infection control um, nurse or infection control group um, is so important. I can, in my um, practice standards role, I can really tell the difference when you go into a practice where someone's in charge of infection control. But I think that's going to give uh, all of our um, delegates who are listening to this really, really good information and really fits in well with the other webinars in our series, um, with, with the, the, Tim talking about the, the organisms, and then we're going to go to, on to talk about which disinfectants and something that you touched on today about how to, how to audit it. So thank you so much, Liz, that was brilliant. I forgot to say at the beginning that Liz is one of the trustees of RCVS Knowledge. So thank you very much for doing this. If any of you have got questions as a result of this, um, then there's an, an email address there on the screen. Please um, do email in your questions and, and Liz or, or um, people within the team will try and answer them for you. And also, we've also got um, a large number of resources on infection control on the RCVS Knowledge website in the QI, the quality improvement section under infection control. There's lots of resources, COVID resources, general infection control resources. So please use those. Um, there for you to 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 use um, and just thank you very much Liz, for listening and thank you so much again Liz.